Okay, Greg, here's a question from Bryce. Is general revelation, Romans 1.20, enough to lead to salvation, or is personally putting your faith in Christ the only way to the Father, John 14.6? Well, <laughs> if John 14.6 says that, I guess then Jesus is correct on that. Uh, general revelation plays a role. And I, I think there are far too many Christians that are ambiguous about this. And they'll say, we don't know what happens to the people who never heard. Well, Romans 1 is probably the most elegant characterization of the significance and the content of general revelation. Now, to be clear, Romans 1 doesn't tell us about, in this section, doesn't tell us about Jesus. It doesn't tell us about the Son. It tells us about the Father. But it says the Father, the evidence of the Father is available to everyone. And Paul identifies two ways it's evident. One in the external world, that which has been created, what's been made, and something is going on internally, because he says God has made it evident within them. And this is what Calvin called the sensus divinitatus. So there are two things going on. There's an external witness and an internal witness. I do talk about this a little bit in a, in a, uh, after a fashion in the tactics, the new tactics book, the, uh, in, in the chapter on inside out. And the point is that there's certain things that are built into every human being. Uh, in virtue of being made the image of God, and, and, and that are still operable even after the fall, operating, and that we can use to our benefit, you know, because these are going to come out. They're, that which is inside comes out. That's the inside-out uh, tactic, tactical m maneuver. And they have to do with these things that we know to be true about God, even when our our mouths and our worldviews deny it. We can't, as I say in the last line of the chapter, we can run from God, but we can't run from ourselves. So, um, but the question now is, given that revelation outside and inside, and in the second chapter, he talks about the moral law being part of everybody. Well, that's inside for sure, our awareness of morality. Well, um what what power has that God? I'm sorry. What what is that adequate to save us? This awareness and the answer Paul gives is no. He does not imply anywhere that you can be rescued simply in virtue of natural revelation. He he says they are without excuse twice in that passage. And so there is clear statements by Paul that natural revelation is real, it's adequate to inform about the Father, and it is adequate to condemn. It, he does not suggest it's adequate to save. Now, having said that, it's clear that there are all kinds of people in the Old Testament that seemed to fall under the mercy of God that didn't know about Jesus, obviously, because there was no Jesus. And only the Jews had an anticipation of Jesus. I was reading the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, only the sign of Jonah will be given you. And then later it says, the people of Nineveh will rise up and condemn the people of uh, Capernaum, for example. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder what precisely happened there <laughs> in Ju with Nineveh, and I went back, and there's not a lot to read, and he, condemnation was preached, finally, eventually, by Jonah, and the people repented. They changed their ways, and they presumed that a change in way would result in the mercy of God. So now you have not a lot of detail about salvation, but a an understanding that there, God is merciful and will respond to turning to him and away from evil. And so there is a, a certain gospel there. Clearly, the people of Nineveh, many of them are going to be, are, uh, did attain to salvation because they're going to be the judges of the cities in, in, uh, in, in the Galilee that Jesus was referring to. And what did they know? They didn't know much. 
Okay, so but they threw themselves upon the mercy of God, sackcloth and ashes. They repented. All right. So people can be rescued, at least in the Old Testament um, economy, by an appeal to God's mercy without a whole lot of detail. But um, Greg, but, would you— But in the New Testament— Wouldn't you say, though, that with Nineveh, that was— they weren't necessarily achieving salvation. They were receiving salvation. They were just receiving God relenting from his judgment of their nation. Do you think well, that they were actually the repenting? I would say salvation. Yeah, the reason I say that is because of what Jesus says. The people of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against those in Capernaum, for example. And so I, I take that to mean they're rising up in judgment because they did what the people in Capernaum didn't do. Because something greater than Jonah and that preaching is here now before you. So um, I, I I take that to that their responsiveness to God's charge, uh, the bad news that they heard, uh, their responsiveness in turning to Him in mercy and, re, and relenting. Um, I think that uh, I take that as salvific, which is why Jesus words that the way he does. And just like uh, the, the, the um, you know, the, the Queen of Sheba, you know, the same thing there, because he cites her as well, coming to see Solomon. So uh, th- it's, it's clear that there are Old Testament, there is Old Testament salvation apart from Judaism proper. I mean, Moses, uh, you got Melchizedek for one. Uh, some people think he's not a real person, but it, it seems to me that he is. And you have Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, who is a worshiper of the true God, and he doesn't have the Mosaic sacrificial system. But there is some, there is a sense in which he is trusting in and turning to the true God. And we know that faith is the requirement through the whole system, going all the way back to the uh, to the archetype of faith, which is Abraham. And so that is repeated frequently. So it's possible for Old Testament saints to express faith in God that's salvific without much information. However, when it comes to the New Testament, um, we we see a whole different thing going on. Jesus is the ground of salvation. Anybody who gets saved in the Old Testament not having heard of Jesus is saved because of Jesus, all right? In the New Testament, the object of faith and the grounds of salvation are the same. And that's why the statements are made People have to believe in Jesus in order to be rescued. And it seems to me univocal. I'm not willing to say, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to people who never heard of Jesus. I think Paul makes it clear. Mm-hmm. If they're guilty, they will get judged. They are without excuse. If they're seeking God, God will see to it that they get the message. And there are biblical examples of that. Cornelius is a great example. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was, look at all the accolades there. He prayed regularly, he gave alms, and uh, etc. And, uh, you know, he had visions from God, all this, angels, but he wasn't saved. That's why he needed the gospel. And that's what we see happening in Acts 10. So that's where I stand. I think that's the safest way to be. By the way, I think it's safer to, pre- to, to preach the narrower view, because if we're wrong, there's more people in heaven than we thought. If we teach the broader view, especially without biblical justification, and we're wrong, <laughs> well, then we've given false hope to people who needed Christ, and that's not a good place mm-hmm. to be. I mean, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, and that's that's as clear as you can get. But, at, but I think you're right, Greg. There are a lot of points that say this, and the one that comes to mind immediately is the Romans 10 verse, where Paul is saying that Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom, who, him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? In other words, you do need to know about Jesus in order to be saved. And of course, Greg, you have a, a what's the name of the lecture that you've done that they can purchase in our store? The heathen. I can't remember the title. It's about oh, the, the heathen, heathen and the unknown God. I and, go into yeah. detail there, but I also wrote mm-hmm. a piece that that goes over some of this material. Uh, it's available online. It's uh, it is something like um, 
is one way the only way or uh, something to that effect. I think we, we re-released that with additions and uh, uh, or No Other Name is a part one and no part two are, mm-hmm. are iterations of that material. So uh, um, one way or any way is another way I think we've characterized that. But um, notice in your Romans passage that you just cited, though, if you keep reading following that, so G- he is – as you pointed out, identifying the fact that we need to have a preachment of specific things about Jesus for salvation. But then he says, and some people are going to say, we never heard. Well, you have. And then he goes to statements about general revelation. The line has gone out through all the earth, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so everybody has enough information to be held guilty, even if they don't have enough information to be rescued. And the way that someone put this for me, and I thought it made a lot of sense, if you're asking for money to help you and I offer you 10 bucks and you turn it down, why would I offer you 100 if you won't even take that 10? Now, that, that's a parallel to people who reject the Father based on general revelation. Why would God give them any special revelation? They've already poked God in the eye, you know, said no to him. So why would he be obliged to give more? Now, he does give more in many cases. By the kind intention of his will, he goes and he reaches out to people. And there's wonderful stories of amazing ways God has revealed himself to people in very obscure circumstances. Uh, I have a book called um, Eternity in Their Hearts where some of these stories, Don Richardson, are are recorded. Um, But uh, the point is, even in those cases, they get saved through a knowledge of Jesus not through a general knowledge of some divine God, some divine being who created everything. That's just the first step. And when they respond to that, then more is given. Until what is given is necessary for salvation, they put their trust in that. 